Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to the broadcast ministry of Return to the Word with Pastor Mark Fontecchio, advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now, here is pastor and author Mark Fontecchio. I like the story about a young man who came from a family with money. I mean, not just a little bit of money. This, this family had money, a lot of money. So he went and bought one of the best cars around. If you have money, you can do that. And he bought a Ferrari GTO. Now, these are expensive cars, very nice cars. And he decided to take the car out for a spin. And he stopped at a red light. And an old man pulled up next to him on a moped. And the old man looked over at the shiny brand new car and they started just talking, just kind of chatting back and forth. And the old man leaned in to take a look and just had to know how much this car was worth. The young man explained that the car cost him about half a million dollars. Well, the old man, he couldn't believe this. Why would you pay a half a million dollars for a car? I mean, Micah wouldn't pay more than $500 for a car. So why would you pay half a million dollars for a car? Couldn't believe it. And the young man explained, he said, this car can go well over 200 miles an hour. This baby can move. And just then the light turned green. So what do you do when you're talking about how fast your car can go? You got to punch it. You got to punch it. You got to put the pedal down. So the young man decided to show what the car could do and he floored it. Knowing his car can go zero to 60 in less than three seconds. Oh, that would be fun. And he was enjoying the wide open stretch of road, this beautiful wide open stretch of road, nothing around. And he got the car up to about 160 miles an hour. Who's ever been that fast in a car? Be honest. But then suddenly he noticed this dot in the rear view mirror. And it kept getting closer. And he slowed down to see what it could be. But then something sped by him even faster than what he was going. And this confused him because he couldn't figure out what could go faster than this car. But then ahead of him, he saw it again. And this time it was going past him in the other direction. And it looked like the old man on the moped. And it couldn't be, he thought to himself. How can this be? How can a moped, an old man, outrun a Ferrari? And just then he looked up. He saw the dot in his rearview mirror, followed by a bang as a speeding object crashed into the back of his car. The young man, he jumped out as quick as he could, and he saw the old man lying on the pavement. And knowing he was badly hurt, he ran to him, and he asked, what can I do to help you? And the old man just whispered, unhook my suspenders from your side view mirror. The moral of the story, I'm pretty sure that never actually happened, but the moral of the story is to be careful in what you get attached to. Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 are some of the most difficult chapters in the book. But not only do I want you to see as we go through these two chapters that you can understand it and that there is one correct intended meaning in Scripture by God, but I want you to walk away with this lesson to be careful in what you get attached to. Be careful what you get attached to because it could destroy you in the end. You know, we get attached to a lot of things. There's no end to it. We get attached to entertainment. We get attached to hobbies. We get attached to people. That's why funerals are always so hard. We get attached to stuff. We like our stuff. We like our our toys. We like our houses. We like our cars. We like all sorts of things. And it's not wrong to have some of these things. That's not wrong. But when they have you, do you hear the difference? When they have you, then you are in trouble. You know, the worldly man boasts, he who dies with the most toys wins. You see a lot of that idea in Alaska. But the truth is, he who dies with the most toys still dies. They still die. 1 John 2.17, it teaches the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So I want to challenge you this morning before we get into our text. What are you pursuing? The pleasures of this world or the will of God? If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 17 because Revelation 17 shows us what happens to those who pursue after the pleasures of this fallen world. Verse 1 starts our study. It says, 
Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I want you to travel back in time with me for a second this morning to the time right after the flood, right after Noah's death, to the time of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Instead of following the command of God to Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply over the earth, the descendants of Noah, they moved to the east, to the ancient location of Babylon. They defied God. They defied his command to spread out throughout the world, preferring to stick together and build a tower. Why? Why did they do this? Well, verse 4 of Genesis 11 tells us, it says, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, it was very common back then to build these mounds or these towers in their worship, and they're known as ziggurats. This one right here is known as the ziggurat of Ur. It's located in Iraq. It has been partially rebuilt, but it was first built about 2100 B.C. Here's one from Iran, over in Iran, by the ancient city, Persian city of Susa. And the pyramids in Egypt came from this same basic idea. And it's the reason that after God dispersed the people of the earth in Genesis 11, that they took their ideas with them. The people came. It's the old thing. If you go out into the woods, you still bring yourself with. Well, they did. They brought their ideas with them. And that's why you see them all over the world. The Mayans built them in what we know today as Mexico and Central America. This one's kind of neat. I like this one. Each face on the side of this, each side of the pyramid has a stairway of 91 steps. 91 steps on four sides. If you're doing the math, you can track that. That's a total of 364 steps. And then they have a shared step on top that they share, making for a grand total of 365 steps the number of days in the year. Do you see where they were going there? The Aztecs, they built them too. You can find them all over the world because when God scattered the people, they took their ideas with them. Here we have what is known as a step pyramid. It's a Hindu temple from Indonesia. That's in Indonesia. Looks familiar, doesn't it? It looks familiar. But it should, because why? God scattered the nations and the people took their ideas with them. This one has a little bit of a different flair. It's known as the Tomb of the General. That's found in China. They're scattered all over the world. Let us make a name for ourselves, they said. In Genesis 11, in order to avoid the very thing that God commanded, spreading out over the whole earth, the people decided to make a name for themselves. It's exactly the problem with mankind today. It's the same thing men do all the time today. Make a name for ourselves. And verse 3 of Genesis tells us this. It says, they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Now, Josephus adds a little interesting detail. He records for us that they coated the bricks, specifically making them waterproof. Now, why would you do that? Why would you make the Tower of Babel waterproof? The only reason you would do this is because you didn't believe the promise of God that he was never going to send again a global flood. That's the only reason you would do it. It would be to make this tower hold up in a second flood because you didn't believe God. The entire project was designed to reach up to the heavens. It was an attempt to earn something that only God can grant, access to heaven. One ancient source records this, that the purpose was to ascend up to heaven. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn a few things, actually. Three foundations of man-made and false religion are this. They include a rejection of the promises of God, people without faith. It includes a rebellion against the commands of God, disobedient people. And it includes a refusal of God's grace, which leads men trying to earn God's grace. So how did God respond? You know the story. How did God respond? He confused their language and scattered them all over the earth. 
verse 9 of Genesis. It says, therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language. And I, I still struggle with that, because I still struggle with languages, Greek and Hebrew, all the time. And I think to myself, well, there's the problem right there. The Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Now, the people didn't want to live in God's grace, so what did God do? God forced them to obey. But they kept making gods after their own image as they spread out upon the earth. The plain of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel had been built, eventually became, you know this from history, the center of one of the world's greatest empires. It became Babylon. This was a city that was filled with religious pride. Filled with religious pride. They boasted that their city was invincible, and it almost was. They said it was constructed in heaven by the gods as a celestial city. They boasted of it as a heavenly city. And so you can see how even after its collapse became a metaphor for counterfeit religion. So as you look to verse 1 of Revelation 17, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls talked with John. Now, this is not saying, if you're tracking with the text, it's not saying that chapters 17 and 18 take place after the bold judgments. It's not saying that. It's just telling us that one of the seven angels came and served as a guide to show John everything we're about to read in these two chapters. Chapter 17 actually takes place at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, half of the way through the seven years of tribulation. Now, there are differences between chapter 17 and 18 that you need to know about if you're going to understand the text. Chapter 17 is about spiritual Babylon. Chapter 18 is about a political Babylon. Let me say it again, because if you don't get that, you're going to be confused. Chapter 17 is about spiritual Babylon. Chapter 18 is about a political Babylon. And John is seeing a vision in the first six verses of chapter 17 of the destruction of spiritual Babylon. It is the destruction of the false religion that will unite the world in the first half of the tribulation, only to be replaced with the worship of the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation. That's what John is telling us in verse 1. It's the judgment of the great harlot sitting upon many waters. Now, the great harlot, what's the great harlot? Well, the great harlot is a personification of spiritual idolatry. It's what it is. It's spiritual fornication. And this Babylon is going to dominate all of mankind. You know, in the same way that we might refer to Wall Street when referring to the financial system of this country. Chapter 17 is referring to Babylon as this final godless, humanistic, worldwide religious system. Now, waters in the text. Waters, what does that refer to? Well, that's the many nations in bed with Babylon. We know this. How do we know this? Because verse 15 is going to tell us exactly this, where it says this. It says, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So verse 2, it teaches, speaking of harlot Babylon... It says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the kings of the earth here in the text in Revelation 17 are the world leaders who are the heads of their kingdoms. This scarlet woman has one craving. What is her craving? Her craving is power, 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 power. And to get that power, she will abandon every principle, every single principle. She will court the kings of the earth and do anything they want as long as they give her power. Strong language in the word of God here. Very strong language. Intentionally strong language referring to spiritual adultery. Designed to give us this picture of those who are supposedly reconciled to God but are untrue to that relationship. Meaning they're not really reconciled to God. It is, let's say it like this, the counterfeit faith the one world religion that already has a foundation that is alive and well on this planet today. The idea of spiritual adultery, it is used to refer to people in scripture who are said to follow God, but their worship is not of God. Spiritual adultery, the alliance of a false religion with the political powers of the world, compromising with the governments of the world. Now, the church of Jesus Christ is not present in the tribulation, but the apostate church absolutely will be present in the tribulation. 
Charles Spurgeon said this long ago, and I, I think he would see the same thing today, definitely in the church. He said, I believe a very large majority of churchgoers are merely unthinking, slumbering worshipers of an unknown God. Strong words. I think he's right. Those left behind in their unbelief at the rapture will unify with the apostate church of the tribulation, unified with the kings of the earth, leading the people of the world astray. It's going to lead to spiritual, religious drunkenness by the people of the earth in the first part of the tribulation. Drunkenness, why? Because this false religion will control the people of the earth. The people will be in a drunken stupor, intoxicated by spiritual adultery. And so verse 3, it continues, it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. John is carried away by the spirit into the wilderness. John was taken away in the vision, in the vision, not in his physical body. From the wilderness, John is able to see the woman described before as the great harlot. She's sitting on a scarlet beast, a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy. Now this beast, I want you to notice with me, it specifically tells us it has seven heads and ten horns. And the horns, the horns are ten kingdoms or positions of power. These are the ten toes of the statue in Daniel 2. Ten positions or kingdoms that must be fulfilled at the same time. If you understand Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, they have to be fulfilled all at the same time. Ten kings, ten positions in power at the same time. And I don't care how much you scour church history, it's never happened. It's never been fulfilled all at the same time. It's the ten horns of Revelation 13.1, where it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. This is the revived Roman Empire headed up by the Antichrist. Now, we call it the revived Roman Empire because Daniel 2 tells us it comes out of that same region of that Roman Empire. This is all about the government that they had back then and the government that will be. This is about government. It's not about the culture so much. The revived Roman Empire in character will be the center of world government of Gentile power in that day. So to understand what prophecy is telling us, you need to recognize that the beast is a political power. It's a political power. The harlot, the woman riding the beast, is the religious power. The religious power. That is separate from the beast. But what is she doing? She's riding the beast. Now that tells us two things. It actually tells us two important things. She rides the beast. She is supported by the political power of the beast. Right? If you're riding something, you're supported by something. She's supported by the political power of the beast. But if you've ever ridden a horse, then you know that the person riding is in the dominant role, that they are the one who controls and directs the beast. But there's something different about these seven kings. The references to these seven kings tells us that they're not all ruling at once. And we're going to see that next week more explicitly in the text. The ten horns are ruling all at once in the tribulation. But we're going to see a reference down in verse 10 next week that tells us something different about these particular seven kings. That their governments succeed one another in history. So the beast, the political government of the tribulation, will be guilty of blasphemy. But this spiritual harlot, the apostate church of the first half of the tribulation, will be the driving force of the world. And I do think it is worth noting, I do think it's absolutely worth noting, that the only form of a worldwide church recognized in the Bible is the apostate world church. The apostate world church that is going to come into power after the church of Christ, the bride of Christ, is safely taken home at the rapture. This spiritual harlot will be arrayed in purple and scarlet, it tells us, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now, I'm going to step on some toes, and I'm sorry. I am not trying to be offensive, okay? But I have to be truthful to Scripture. I have to be truthful 
to Scripture. And if you can't see this, I'm sorry. But it is the same type of thing that is seen in the high officials of the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church today. It is what you see in all the ritualistic churches. Purple and scarlet, gold, precious stones, pearls. They all represent beauty. They represent all the trappings of man-centered religion and leaders of these apostate churches wearing expensive garments. It's a counterfeit religion. It's a counterfeit beauty. It's a counterfeit faith straight from the pits of hell. When coupled with false religion, it represents a church that prostitutes the truth. That's what Scripture is telling us. It prostitutes the truth because what is inside of her is filthy, disgusting. It's unclean and it's unholy before a righteous God. But the most striking aspect of verse 4 is that she has in her hand what? A golden cup of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. The word of God is not mincing words here, is it? It's not sparing any words at all. It's being blunt. It describes the filthiness of the impure relationship in the sight of God. Now the golden cup, outwardly beautiful, but inwardly filled with the things that God hates. So we can just go to scripture and find all the things that are listed out in scripture that God absolutely hates. It's not that hard. It's listed out in scripture. Abominations in the scriptures are listed as the things that God hates. So what do we see in scripture? Well, we see specifically listed these things. God hates carved images of pagan gods. It's listed in scripture. Tells us in Deuteronomy 7 that this is an abomination to the Lord. He hates idol worship. Deuteronomy 17. The God of the Bible hates witchcraft. Deuteronomy 18. Again, listed as an abomination. And according to Leviticus 18, he hates sexual sin. Oh, he hates a lot of the perversion going on today. He hates it. But the very thing that God hates, these godless practices, they're going to be in Rome's golden cup. And the most despicable of these will be the murder of God's people. The murder of God's people. Let's pick it up with verse 5. It says, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now, much persecution has already taken place under the banner of a false church. Just pick up any book on church history. I could spend the next week just listing off the persecution that has taken place. You'll find the pages of church history stained with the blood of the saints from the hands of the counterfeit church. The persecution alone from the Roman Catholics was so intense and so widespread for so much of church history that today's Catholics do not even like being reminded of it. You want to make them angry, talk about this. Just consider one example. Let me just give you one example from church history. Roman Catholic Queen Mary she ruled England known as Bloody Mary for a good, good reason. Some 288 Christians were burnt at the stake for their stand for Christian truth between 1555 and 1558. The first of these martyrs was a man by the name of John Rogers. John Rogers is a very important name in church history. You see, when Tyndale went to prison, eventually he would be executed as a heretic. But Tyndale left his English translation. He left his English translation of the books of Joshua to Chronicles in the safe arms of John Rogers. He was the one who continued on the work after Tyndale went to prison. And he published a Bible. He published it in a pseudoname because he didn't want to get killed for his faith. So he published it in a pseudoname in what became known as the Matthew Bible the very first officially authorized version in the English language. Be thankful for him and his faith. But when the winds of politics changed, he was the first one killed for the faith in England. And as he stood chained to a stake, the fire was rising up around him, up to his legs and shoulders, and he rubbed his hands in the flames as if he was washing his hands in cold water. Then he lifted his hands to heaven and held them high until he was completely consumed by fire. 
Now, this barbarity was committed in the name of religion. It was committed in the name of the Catholic Church. But Rogers went to the stake with such calm and with such dignity that the French ambassador at the time wrote that he went to his death, listen, as if he was walking to his wedding. His courage was so obvious that the huge crowd actually burst out into an applause when they saw him walking to the stake. Because there's a man that believes it. There's a man with faith. It's not enough to call yourself a Christian. It's not enough to call yourself a Christian. You better be specific with what you believe and what you mean in the days ahead. 88% of current members of our Congress call themselves Christians. So does the current president of the United States. He considers himself to be a Catholic Christian. But he announced he's going to codify a federal abortion law, putting a law in the books that codifies Roe versus Wade. So it's a law of the land to murder babies, all in the name of Christ. He's committed to restoring funding for abortions all over the world. Know what you believe. Be specific in what you believe. Because the closer we get to the tribulation, the more the apostate ecumenical church is going to dominate the landscape. And if you're not going to take the time to learn what you believe now, you are going to have massive problems in the future. And I won't be able to help you then. Doctrine's going to divide. The gospel of Jesus Christ is going to divide. Christ himself is going to divide. And John tells us on the forehead, she's going to have a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now, mystery, I don't believe it's part of the title written on her name. It's a description of her title. The meaning is clear to me that this is not a reference to a city, but to the spiritual Babylon, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now understand with me that many of the pagan rites of ancient Babylon have crept into the church of Jesus Christ, and you need to know church history. You can get angry with me, but get angry with me for a reason. Back it up with facts, because church history will bear it out. It's these pagan rites that were a dominating force in creating and in corrupting what went on to become the Roman Catholic Church. Satan always has a substitute. For much of history in the last 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ was but a remnant, oppressed and on the run for their faith. Why do we expect anything different today? So how did all this happen? Well, let's go back in time again. Can we do that? Can we go back in time again? Let's go back in time to Genesis 10. This time in Genesis, we are told that one of the sons of Noah was Ham. Ham. And one of the sons of Ham was Cush. And one of the sons of Cush was Nimrod, the founder of Babylon. His wife became the head of the mystery religions there that included the worship of idols. She became the high priestess of idol worship. She was known as Semiramis. And she gave birth to a son and claimed that it was a miraculous birth. Now this son was given the name Tamaz and he was considered a savior to the people. He was a false messiah, a false messiah and said to be the fulfillment of the promise given to Eve. Now, Satan, let's remember that just for a second. Satan has access to the throne of God. He's not ignorant. He's very wise, wise in his own ways. Satan knew God was going to send a savior, a Messiah. So he got ahead of the game in Genesis 10. And this is where it started in Babylon. Just as the temples and pyramids were spread throughout the known world, so were the idols of the mother, pictured as the queen of heaven, Queen of Heaven was her title, a title now given to Mary in the Catholic Church. And out of this Babylonian worship came this concept of having priests, priests who furthered the worship of both the mother and the child. And then they practiced the sprinkling of holy water. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Tamas, the son, was said to have been killed by a wild beast and afterward brought back to life. Another satanic anticipation and counterfeit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The scriptures have many, many references to this false religion. The scriptures condemn it all throughout the Old Testament. Ezekiel protests against the ceremony of weeping for Tamez. Look at Ezekiel 8.14. It says, So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tamez. 
Jeremiah mentions the heathen practice of making cakes for the queen of heaven. That's where that came from. Jeremiah 7.18 talks about it and it says, in Jeremiah, the children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. And then over in Jeremiah 44, you can read later, there's an extended passage where the people burned incense and made cakes for the queen of heaven. Baal worship was another form of this same type of idolatry. See, if you notice, Satan had an unholy trinity, didn't he? He had Nimrod as the father, Semiramis as the mother, and then Tamaz. This Babylonian worship manifested itself in Israel in the worship of Baal. It was all related. This Babylonian cult permeated the ancient world, always standing in contrast to the God of scriptures. So how do we put this back into the context of Revelation? Well, let me connect it and show you what we're talking about. We know that this Babylonian cult spread throughout the land, including the city of Pergamos, one of the seven churches of Asia that John was writing to. When the Persians took over Babylon in 539 B.C., they looked at some of these mystery religions in Babylon and said, this is a little strange. Let's be uh, done with this. So they didn't like them, and they tried to discourage them. They tried to bring them to an end. So the cults of Babylon, where did they move to? They moved to Pergamum, also known as Pergamus. And the chief priests of the Babylonian cult, and get your mind around this picture, the chief priests of the Babylonian cult wore crowns in the form of the head of a fish in recognition of the fish god. The chief priest had the title. It's where that hat on the Pope comes from, by the way. The chief priest had the title keeper of the bridge imprinted on the crowns representing the bridge between man and Satan. The Roman equivalent of the title is Pontifex Maximus, used by the Caesars and the later Roman emperors and was adopted as the title for the Bishop of Rome. And what is the Pope today called? He's called Pontiff, which comes from this Pontifex. And then later in history, here's what happened. The leaders of the Babylonian mystery cults moved again. This time they moved from Pergamum over to Rome. They moved to Rome. And in an effort to be first century seeker sensitive, second century and third century seeker sensitive, the early Catholic Church basically took on the practices and attempted to combine the mystery religions of Babylon with the Christian faith. They tried to bring it all together. And so this polluted the counterfeit church, and it will be center stage in the first half of the tribulation. She'll be the one actively engaged in the persecution of anyone who comes to faith in the tribulation. And it's not just going to be Rome. She'll be made up of all forms of pagan worship, the Greek Orthodox, all these different churches, including the perversions of the Christian faith and all the religions of the world. All the religions of the world are going to come together as one. And these interfaith covenants and partnerships, they've already started. They've already begun between the Muslims and the Catholics and the world religions. This picture is from 2019 in Dubai, when an interfaith covenant was signed between the Muslims and the Catholics, and it was labeled the Human Fraternity Meeting. And it was referred to be seen as an opportunity to discuss world peace and to be a springboard to develop harmony in all religions and all faith. This is the type of mindset that will lead to what is described in the book of Revelation. The depravity of this apostate church and her wickedness in the sight of God can be seen in the statement in verse 6, that she was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The false church of the tribulation will slaughter God's people. It will slaughter God's people. And the fact that she is drunk implies that murdering believers is something that the woman is addicted to, and in it she finds pleasure. She finds pleasure from killing God's people. Jesus himself the Apostle Paul, so many countless saints were violently executed at the hands of the Roman authorities. But this type of day is going to come again. And John ends the verse by saying, And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And we'll look at the explanation, Lord willing, next week. Many years ago, in the early 1900s, there was a missionary to Africa by the name of Dan Crawford. And he was returning from Africa to the United States. 
And this meant that he had to cross and he had to leave the inner part of the continent of Africa and travel to the coast to catch a ship. And four men walked along with him so he wouldn't have to make the trip all by himself throughout Africa. And as they walked, Crawford, Crawford he, he told his friends about some of the modern marvels of life that they had never seen before. He was just excited about some of these things. He told them about lights that didn't have to have a flame. That's pretty cool. He told them about wagons that were not pulled by animals so that they could now be powered by engines instead. And the new ways of storing food so that it wouldn't spoil all the modern inventions of the early 1900s. And as he walked and talked, three of the men joined in him with the conversation. And the fourth man, he seemed so unimpressed with anything he had to say. And it started to bother Crawford. It started to bother him a lot. And you could tell when someone's not paying attention. And it was bothering him. And it was grinding at him. And after a few days of this... After a few days of walking, as they were sitting around one evening, Crawford found it to be irritating that this man did not seem to be excited about going to the city. So he asked the man, he said, aren't you eager to get there? And let me tell you that that African brother in Christ responded with a word that I wish every Christian in America, they could have this word burned into their hearts permanently. The man said, listen, the man said to him, Mr. Crawford, to be better off is not to be better. Wrestle with that thought if you have the courage. To be better off is not to be better. There is a warning in Revelation 17 for those that are willing to hear it. It is to be careful what you become attached to in the days ahead. Be careful. Put your faith in Jesus Christ first. Make your faith a priority. Make your time in the Word of God a priority. Put your family before your job. There's going to be temptations, plenty of temptations. There's always temptations to be better off. Don't sacrifice your time with your family just so you can have a bigger house or more things that you don't need. Learn in the days ahead to be content in Christ. Learn to be content with less stuff. If you're constantly finding your happiness and your joy and contentment in life and spending money, you have a problem. That's where your happiness is. Christians are becoming enslaved to so many things today. Christians are becoming enslaved to the government. Always looking for a handout. That's shocking to see. That's not going to end well. Christians are becoming enslaved to debt to the trap of always wanting more, but to be better off is not to be better. Christians are becoming conditioned and enslaved to the culture of our day, always on our stupid phones, always watching TV, being a little more programmed by the government, a little more programmed by the media, always being more conditioned to be like the world. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time I checked, those TVs still have an off switch, do they not? They do, right? They have an off switch. Why don't fathers, you get out your Bibles and read them with your family. It's your responsibility before God. Shut the stupid things off. Christians are becoming enslaved, and we see this during the COVID era. Christians are becoming enslaved to the idea of playing it safe. To the idea that the Christian faith is always going to be comfortable and easy. That's not the path forward. That is not the path forward. So here's where I stand. I rest in Jesus Christ. I rest in him alone. I rest in his word. I rest in knowing that no matter what's going to come, I have a living hope centered in him, centered in Jesus Christ himself. I'm not scared of the future. I'm not scared one bit. No matter who's in the White House, it doesn't bother me. These things are going to come. Because in Christ, I find security. And in Christ, I find confidence And everything that I need for life and godliness, it's all there. So find your sufficiency in him. Learn to live in his peace till the day that he takes us back home. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. 
Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.